My first guest is a man who's had troubled times of late. I remember him years and years ago in Blackpool doing a sellout, remarkable performance, which just blew the audience away. He's had many TV hits, including Strike It Rich, Strike It Lucky, and of course, My Kind of People. Michael Barrymore is one of those people of late that just seems troubled, especially after his experiences in the Big Brother house. He's had litigation after litigation and has been through very difficult times of late with bankruptcy and emotional difficulties. I recently met up with Michael in a Birmingham hotel and I began by asking him how he was feeling. Yeah, I'm really well. I'm OK. Would you, in what way do you mean OK? Like, as opposed from one extreme to that, yeah. Well, just the fact that the media's had such a go at you and yeah. you've, you've gone through this whole turmoil after what happened. Everybody's asking you difficult questions. Yeah. Are you OK? Yes, I am OK. I actually am really well because what I did when I went to New Zealand... Um, Bill Kenwright, who, who, who owns the production of Scrooge, he said, uh, my mum said to me, she said, the trouble with uh, Michael is, he said, she, he's made me happy all his, uh, all, all my life, but he's never given any time to himself, and that's what I needed to do. And I did that for three years there. A friend of mine said years ago, the trouble is, he said, you know, when you learn to make uh, love yourself, you'll be all right. I said, I've no perception of what loving yourself means. And then I found out all it is is taking care of yourself and giving time to yourself and not, you know, people pleasing everybody else. And you end up with nothing yourself. I did that, put me in a good place. There was a while, I know what you mean, where I was, uh, um, and I said, like, um, and, uh, and I'm, I'm, I wasn't that great or I'm still getting better at it on a one to one uh, situation being interviewed and what I've done in my life is to work to a mass crowd when we used to watch you on Saturday nights on ITV and when we saw you in those live shows you had such a great vibrance and you just seemed to love it is this still the same passion today? yeah absolutely and I think it's, it's, it's been proved with Scrooge you know uh, I, I, it's given me the chance to go exactly where, back where I was and I think you should all the times so I've had a bit of a roller coaster life to say the least uh, there are a lot of similarities to the stories of Scrooge um, except I'm generous he's not or he isn't at the beginning um, uh, that, 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 that you learn to realise that it's not nobody's personally having a go at you although it can seem like that this is just your, it's my journey and my life and you should go right this is the negative side there's a reason it's going to come right in the, in the end and, and I, I love I've never lost a passion for what I do You've certainly had an interesting life and a huge rise to fame. I mean, you really were the biggest thing on TV for a long time. Yeah. Do you think those days will ever return in terms of TV, or does it not matter now? I love what I do. Of course I want to be out there. And people say, do you want to get back to the television? Well, of course I do. I used to, when I used to answer that question, I used to go, well, you know, if it comes along, and, and, and I think to myself, why don't you just say, no, I want to be there, and I'd love to be there. Obviously, I can't cast myself. That's for others to do. And like Bill Kenwright went... Oh, I'm going to use him. I'm going to put in this huge investment for him. And, you know, he, like anything, there's no guarantees, but he went down that road, same as the people who asked me to do the book. That's a huge investment. I wrote the book. And, and the DVD, the Strike It Lucky DVD. It's got to be something to do with the public, because without that, I don't think you're anything, really, are you? Because no. there aren't many TV people can handle the public. No, the public, the, the, that's been the sum total of me and my career and what I'm all about. I actually, uh, there's a lot of people in the business who are really good at what they do. I've never taken that away from them but they don't actually like people now that there's a lot of people like that and i actually like people all people fascinate me i don't care what background they're from they just fascinate me and i think that came across in my work um and i don't think i'd have got the sort of career i, I, I had or have without that contact with people and being so brutally honest and the one thing i broke some rules as well the old school when they used to watch me in the early days go oh you're the comedian you know the the punter on the show the other day, they came back and got a laugh over you and you allowed it to... I said, well, why not? Why shouldn't they get the laugh? When you make eye contact... I remember being interviewed uh, by Wogan years ago when I was a new boy on the block and it was the Wogan show. And he asked me a question and I was looking at him in front of the live audience and I realised he wasn't looking at me or listening to what I was saying. And I disrespect the, the, the Terry, who probably was in some other planet at the time. And I realised he was looking at his cue card and I waved my hand in front of him and he went, <laughs> oh, stab me vital as well. I, I said, I'm over here. I'm here. And he didn't really know what I was talking about. And I just learned from then on that to be honest is the best thing. 
One of the things that I loved about you, particularly with the live stuff, is that you come across that you're a liability and that you're dangerous, but actually you're not. You throw people out of your audience, but they're in on it that it's a gag, and therefore it's okay. You have followed my career, haven't you? I used to open the show, my live show, because a lot of people, because I've been in telly so long, forget that I'm a, I started out as a live performer, stand-up. You know, in the early days, I used to get paid off and dine on my backside a load in the clubs, my training ground, and doing the stag do's, hen parties, working men's clubs. I won a talent competition and started doing the clubs, and I remember getting paid off yet again at another club. And I said to the bloke, I was 19, I said... Um, Oh, I, I, I could have gone to Lambda. He said, you should have done your crap. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but I still got up the next day and went back for more. Let's start at the beginning. What were you like as a child? Actually, I was a very good kid. Um, well, according to my mum, my brother was the one who misbehaved all the time. Apparently, I, I think maybe I was just playing, playing my mum. And I'm the youngest. So the youngest one is always accused. I mean, I was brought up, dad left when I was 11. Um, we were poor, as in no roof over our head, but we're pretty near it. Um, my mum did three jobs, three uh, 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 jobs in a day, all week, just to keep yeah. three of us together. Otherwise, we'd have been taken away. But you always get accused as being the last born of being spoiled because the others are grown up and you get pocket money off them. Um, but as a kid, the humour started very early. and I, I, I just found it was very powerful. I wasn't the best fighter, so if I needed anybody sorting out, Mickey Jarman did it for me because I made him laugh. Um, but the thing, that you've got to watch with comedians and people do it, even if they're not comedians. A lot of us as human beings, what we do is we use humour to cover up what's really going on in our head. And you, that's where you've got to watch... Uh, people like myself and that and can make oh everything's fine and inside they're feeling like crap you know they don't feel well at all I also think now more than ever people find it very hard to distinguish between a person and their act for example Ken Dodd isn't walking around all day going ha ha missus by Joe that's where he goes round you, you're talking about somebody else no 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 he just go ha ha I've seen him do it does he? Yeah. Is that an impression? <laughs> <There's> a, <laughs> by Joe <laughs> but he does do the ha ha bit on the end does he? You're not convinced, are you? No, I'm not at all. <laughs> the time I see Ken, I said, do her half on me, Ken. Go on. <laughs> Without the teeth. Talking of which, we're in a showbiz hotel today, and as I was coming through reception, Cherie Blair walked past me. Did she? What's she doing here? I don't know. I thought she was with you. Uh, no, Zoe Lucker's with me. You oh, know, Zoe. <laughs> really? There she is. She's upstairs. Why didn't I get to interview Zoe instead of you? You want to interview Zoe? Zoe! She should be far more attractive, wouldn't yeah. she? I mean, well, I'll go and talk to Sherry Blair. You talk to Zoe. <laughs> I think that's the way forward. Can I move on to my next question about being on TV and the pressure of being funny when you've got all these people around you trying to make you more funny and telling you how to be funny when, of course, you've been it for 10 or 20 years. Did that affect you or were you just able to disregard all their opinions? Well, um, difficult at the beginning. I'll tell you what, used to get, it's a good example of that. Whenever I, I don't do many, but whenever I do, you get asked to do an advertising campaign they pay you this ridiculous amount of money they get you into the studio and remove everything that they booked you for and say could you know say the product like this and can you do it like that and, you go, and I remember one campaign I said and I was really pushing it because there was a lot of money involved and I said uh, don't you think you should get somebody else I did have my fingers crossed under the table. <laughs> and I, uh, uh, I, said, well, well, I said, well, you've booked me for Michael Barrymore and now you're asking me to be somebody else so it fits the product. Why, why have you booked me? And that does happen a lot. Or they go, you see, you say this here, then you say this there, and then you do your Barrymore bit. I said, what's my Barrymore bit? Well, you know, that, 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 that str you know, those things you do. I said, well, I've got to have a rough idea of what you want me to do. What is it that I do that you want? You know, will you do so I fill the gaps. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that is difficult. It is difficult. You are legendary for your appearances on them. Mm -hmm. And it was always a great moment when we knew you'd won an award. Um, there's one great example with uh, Jonathan Ross where you dislike his telly and it's just those brilliant moments that you don't really get now nobody seems to be willing to take a risk in case somebody doesn't like it in a newspaper and says nasty things about them well I'm glad you brought that up because um, the TV bosses used to go could you possibly just go up and say thank you very much and come back down again you know there's two trains of thoughts here um, there's the crowd that go that's what it's all about sending it up and then there's I was going, you get another journalist who go or interview go don't you think that was terribly cruel what you did to Jonathan well I'd say hang about what did I do to Jonathan I said Jonathan uh, can you manage to do an evening without an autocue pulled his autocue out ripped it out <laughs> threw it over the back of the set now but you know 
if you know the business, he's got another large one up there. There was a commercial break. They put it all back. Yeah, I mean, I didn't know that at the time, but I, I knew he wouldn't be floating around with nothing. OK, we're going to move on and talk about the next part of your life, which was a million miles away from show business and award ceremonies. I want to talk to you about the death of Stuart Lubbock. We should say that you were found innocent of everything in a court of law. But I think it's fair to say you probably didn't come out of it very well in terms of your PR and your reputation and the public's perception of you. Two very honest questions for you. Do you think you reacted badly to it? And secondly, do you think the press gave you a far more difficult time than you deserved? It was a combination of both. I mishandled the situation. You know, I'm nobody's trained in how to deal with tragedy. You know, when you consider I've been in people's front rooms all my life, making them happy, how do you deal with remorse on a public scale? You know, it's not something, you know, that's where I did get into the I'm in an iron thing and then feel not feeling my should I say this shouldn't I say that is it right to say this instead of just saying it I can do it now and then on, what compounded that as well is the outrageous reporting by not all of them but, but a lot of the media you know turning it into something that wasn't uh, quite what it was and to the extreme of it, uh, outrageous uh, headlines and front pages and it, it, got, it was almost too juicy for the editors to go another route the Independent was the only one who went, there's something wrong here, this is not right, and wrote the facts. But the Independent, as good as the paper is, it is, is not strong enough to override, you know, tabloids that sell millions of papers. Um, and, and, you know, basically they wrote me off. Now, I've been for many times in my life when I've been written off. I must be on an elastic or something, because, I mean, the first time I went to rehab in Baltimore, I got blown apart by uh, the tabloid there, and I thought, oh, this is it. I said, Sam Ferriam, goodbye, career public supported me coming out you know again not you know if that had been 10 years earlier uh, maybe I would have lost my career you know decades have changed all our lives for the good some for the bad but you know and then um, the divorce I mean when I was asked you know what, what do you have any regrets in life I said well I don't go down the road of regrets you know my life's my life it's my journey but I would say not having children uh, 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 is a regret. I would love to have had those, but we couldn't. And not having an amicable divorce, you know, the fact that it got, was so battling in front with, uh, on a public stage. And I suppose the combination of that, and it, it took time for me to come through to realise, like, hang about, I mean, I'm not standing for this anymore. It's not fair. You know, I don't see why I should be bashed from pillar to post for something I'm not responsible and I have nothing to do with. And it's just convenient because of my surname to always put it in the headline, whether it's got nothing directly to do with me. And then in the subtext about halfway down, you go, oh, oh yes, of course we know he wasn't responsible and had nothing to do with it. Well, you know, people don't read. When you're driving past, you'd see a really strong headline that's really damning you. You know, that's what goes into people's minds, and it's taken a long period to... You know, I had to deal with me first. That's why I went to New Zealand. I didn't run away. You know, I was uh, at home in this country staring at brick walls. It wasn't healthy. I'd have ended up six foot under, and it was a survival thing. But I'm not fearful of it anymore, and I do agree with you, you know. I perhaps didn't deal with it very well at all, but then I, I haven't got a book on how to deal with life. Is there any worse feeling in the world than opening a newspaper in a morning and seeing your picture on the front page and a headline that is not positive towards you? Oh, absolutely. I don't think all the years... I mean, I've had many years of uh, press and following uh, to that intensity. And, uh, you know, being followed all the time by motorbikes, being followed by cars, uh, outside my house all the time, helicopters over the house taking shots of your garden given any sanctuary. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not... I wouldn't wish it on anybody. Uh, but I dealt with it. And I, I dealt with it in, in the way I, I needed to. Um, sometimes I struggled. I did wake up one morning and thought, I don't know, I'll be better off out of this. And I thought to myself, what the hell are you talking about? Just put yourself in the shower, put your clothes on, and just put yourself in the day. And, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to make any excuses anymore for keep having to you know, um, go down a road of going, well, I'm not sure, well, no, no, you know, I want to just be very positive, you know, I have to get on with my life, as does everybody else. And moving on to Big Brother, where people got to see you again after all the bad stuff that had gone yeah. on, it was the first time we got to see you. Was that a mistake, or are you glad you did it? Well, at first I said no to it, but I'm, I've got to say, just quite clearly, I, I was glad I did it. Absolutely, you know, it was really intense in there. 
Uh, most of the crying at the beginning was me reacting to how fantastic the, the public were for when I went in. It was like rehab with cameras, and I've done enough of those. 